My name's Kate from Cosmic. Most people call me Cosmic Kate. Um, I, I run a, an IT business in East Devon. Um, we're a social enterprise IT business, so we're all about digital inclusion. We've been going for 15 years, and 15 years ago, we thought digital inclusion would be sorted within about three to four years, and we're still here with the same problems now. Um, so what I wanted to, um, to talk with you today about is what technologies are around now and how they've actually, and how technology itself is impacting on businesses, on SMEs across the patch, really. And, um, and also, then, what I want to do is just to dig a bit deeper around the technologies to just describe to you some things that you'll already know and some things that you won't know. And I will be relying on live technology, so it might fail. <laughs> but as long as we can laugh about that, that'll be okay. <clears throat> Um, but first off, I just wanted to share with you this report. I don't know if you've seen it. It was the Boston Consulting Report that came out towards the end of last year. And it was describing quite a few things around technology. But one of the things it did, it, it was looking at the G20, G20 countries, and it was saying, let's take, let's split the businesses in half. Let's say businesses that are adopting technology well and businesses that haven't adopted technology well. And then they said, let's look at the last three years' historic growth figures. And what they found in all the countries was that those that had adopted technology well were growing faster than those that weren't. So this is a really interesting study from the point of view of saying, this technology, if businesses are adopting it, is helping businesses to grow faster. There's some figures there for you to see. In the UK, the figures stood at 12%. For high, for high adopted use, and 4% for low. So about an 8% differential between those two um, types. We know that technology is changing the way that we do business. It's changing behaviours of business as well. And we know that businesses that aren't taking those changes on are the businesses that are going down the pan. I've got an example here, HMV, which is a, um, in the UK, it's a, a CD and a video retail outlet. I'm not sure I'm allowed to say video anymore, <laughs> but um, uh, an outlet, a, a high street outlet. And they didn't take on the online challenge. And whilst they didn't take that on, in the UK last year, they, well, we, we bought half a million CDs, physical CDs, against 183 million downloads. So how quickly has that business model changed in the last three, four years? First iPod came out in 2001. I remember my very first iPod. It was quite chunky and, and lovely. Um, but that, that model has changed so quickly, and some businesses aren't, adopting to, uh, aren't adapting to this change. Some businesses are. The Pearson Group are a uh, publishing house, and they own Financial Times, a newspaper. For the first time ever, they're saying that they've got more digital subscriptions than they have paper-based subscriptions now. And also, Penguin, a classic traditional bookstore, are now selling 20% online. So there are some traditional businesses that are adapting to this change and making it work for them in this environment. We know that customers have changed. Customers now have higher expectations of businesses. I don't know if you've noticed it, expecting higher turnarounds, expecting quicker response rates. We're also expecting more accountability, more accessibility to chief executives, more transparency. All of that's happening, and businesses have got to deal with that. We're also noticing that people are changing. The people that are the digital natives are now employed. We've just taken on six young apprentices in our business, and the, their level of IT, their skill set is incredible. And they are the digital natives. They will very soon be the ones making purchasing decisions in our businesses as well. Staff are changing. We know that money motivates people. We know that money motivates staff. But after a certain level, and there's research, and I can't remember what the actual number is, but after a certain level, 
there's a point at which autonomy, mastery, and purpose become more significant motivators to staff than money. And technology can enable that stuff. We also know that our infrastructure is changing and growing up. Superfast broadband is on its way. We'll be here soon. Um, and, is, and is here in certain areas. Um, certainly where I come from, it's nearly there, um, but getting there in the next three years. But also, um, we're looking at mobile changing. So the fact that we are moving from a 3G landscape to a 4G landscape, which doesn't sound terribly exciting for us in rural areas, until you realize that 4G has a much, lot, much bigger stretch so actually 4G will start to impact in rural areas much more than it will the 3G environments. And also that tariffs are coming down, data tariffs are coming down. So we are getting to the point at which we will be always connected in a fast environment. And as I say, that might take three to five years, but we're getting to that point now. And businesses are changing. Businesses need to be more agile. They need to, well they are, starting to rely less on traditional IT support in the environment. They want their staff to be more flexible. They're bringing in BYOD, bring your own device, not BYOB, bring your own bottle. Um, and also they are really interested in staff retention and motivation. So those are some of the things that are changing in business. Has anyone seen this diagram? Other than Matt and Dawn. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, this came out towards the end of last year. It's, a, it's from Gartner, the IT consultants. And they've called this the nexus of forces. Da, 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 I want a big drum roll at that point. The nexus of forces. And it's saying that these are the big changes, these are the big impacts that are happening to businesses at the moment and they're all technology-based. And they are mobile, social, cloud, and information. And what I'm gonna do now is dig into those a bit more to help you um, to understand those. There's also talk in the IT circles at the moment that there's a fifth one, one that sits in the middle, and it's around risk management. Because one of the issues that businesses face with a lot of this stuff is this is really new. And how do we implement this as businesses and still maintain an element of, of risk management in our businesses? But I won't be talking too much about that today. The first one I'm gonna take is mobile. Apple are talking about the fact that we are now in our fourth generation of technology. Take you back to the first generation when I started, and I started working in the council, when the first generation was productivity. It was when we had Lotus Amy Pro. Does anyone remember Lotus Amy Pro? <laughs> Good old days. Microsoft, and then Microsoft came through, and there was a competition between Lotus and Microsoft. And it was all about productivity. And what's interesting is those products actually haven't changed that much. We might have got a new interface now with um, 2010 or 2013, but that interface hasn't changed much. But that was the first generation of this technology. And then we moved to networks. So we moved to the point when we didn't just have the one computer in the corner, which the one person was allowed to use, and you had to go on a course to actually switch it on, to the point at which we could all start using them and we could all communicate with each other in the business. Then we moved to the area which we've just come out of, which is when we can all talk to each other, regardless of what network we're on, regardless of whether we're in a business or outside of it, we can all talk to each other in that environment. 2.0 is what we've, we've called that. And so the environment we're just moving into is post-PC, is the mobile, the tablet environment. And I can see tablets and mobiles here already. Hands up, who's got a smartphone? Hands up who's got a tablet. 
Hands up who's got a Nokia 3300. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's fascinating that we all have them in this environment. And what I just want to show you next is a little video to um, just to help you um, see that a bit more. If we can get the sound. Stop it. <clears throat> I don't know if there's any facts that you found interesting in there, um, but other than the toothbrush one. <laughs> um, but for me, certainly, some of the facts that I think are interesting, one of them is, is the fact that we have our smartphones with us for 14 hours a day on average. And I know certainly that mine's probably with me pretty much all day, all night. And I don't know if you're the same. There's no other device that we have, a communication device, that we do that with. And I think that's something really important for businesses to realise. And also, one of the things about mobiles that people have noticed is that in a business environment, so if you're in a B2B environment over here, you're using the same device to communicate in the evenings as a customer. So suddenly the transition between B2B and B2C is a really interesting one. The other one I think is interesting is the Google search, the mobile search, is up by 400%. And that search to action on a mobile phone is around about an hour compared to a month on a desktop. So there's some really, really interesting facts in there for businesses. So what that's telling us is we can use our phones for so many more things than talking and texting on. We can use our phones as our wallets. Has anyone got Google Wallet? No. It's nearly here. It's nearly at the point at which we're going to give away our bank details, our debit card details, our credit card details, our loyalty cards, our discount codes, all into our phone and we'll be able to pay using one of these little readers for anything we choose to. So that's already there in the Google environment. It's getting there in the iPhones. We thought it would come out with 5S, but it's not quite there yet. What happens when we lose our phones? <laughs> we can wipe them. So in some ways, it's safer than actually losing your wallet. So you know there are environments where that helps. We can also use our phones and tablets as a mobile card reader. Has anyone used these yet? Square card readers or Huddleby? Place in which 
particularly market store traders or anyone who's out and about meeting customers face to face who are used to taking cash transactions can suddenly now take card transactions without having to spend monthly fees on FPOS machines and those sorts of things. So they can just plug these into the stereo socket of their, of their phone and they can then use them in that way. Of course, they get charged as a fee, a bit like PayPal in that environment. So they can do that. And we're seeing more and more now in the retail environment, particularly um, tablets being used. I was recently at a restaurant where the, the whole menu was on, a, was on a tablet. You ordered it on the tablet, you paid for it on the tablet, and then a real person came out of the kitchen and put the food on your table. So you know, these are being used much more in that environment. We can use our phones to check in. Does anyone use check-in? A little bit. <laughs> yeah. It's not what we do. It's not what we do. It's not in our culture to do it. But our customers might. And this is one of the things I think is really important to get over to businesses, is think about what your customers are doing. Because the power of check-in is when someone checks into your location, they are telling their 150, their 200 friends about your business. And you can create a little advertisement on Facebook or on Foursquare that on their friends' posts appears discount codes or appears an advert about your business. So that's really clever, simple use of mobile advertising in that environment. We can also use our phones to search. We know that we can type into Google. Has anyone had a play with Google goggles? Let's have a go. So the Google app, if we can move over to the... Um, the Google app that you can download on any of your phones. Can you see now at the bottom, you've got goggles, voice, and apps environment. So instead of having to type something in, you can take a photograph of something. So I'm just going to take a photograph here, if it will work, of the logo. Whoa, it's... So it's read something, it's picked something up, and it's bringing me back natural searches from an image. Now, obviously, that's a logo, so that's fairly easy for it to do. But Google Goggles now has plugged in um, any film posters, uh, book covers, um, uh, artwork, any piece of artwork. If you show it the art, it will return natural searches based on who the artist is, um, history of it, all of those sorts of things. If you show it a poster, a film poster, the results will come up including your GPS location of that film when it's on in your local area and click to buy tickets. So there's some really clever technologies going on behind the scenes at the moment that's being brought into Google Goggles. We can also use our phones to explore the world around us. Has anyone had a play with Wikitude? Let's see if I can... So if I come into a new area, like Hereford today, I can open up my TripAdvisor part of Wikitude. And I can get it. Oh, God. Sorry, I just need to calibrate it. So, right, there we go. I can get it to show me the locations around me and what they are, their ratings, all of those sorts of things. And I can click to book through TripAdvisor in that environment. So suddenly, all the databases that exist currently in the internet are being pulled into augmented reality, which is what this is, applications like this. So I'm showing you the TripAdvisor one to get you know, an idea of it. But there's all sorts of databases that are linked into this. Wikipedia, um, the mountain database, so all the hills are logged. So if you ever get lost, you can find out where you are, <laughs> as long as you've got 3G. 
um, but also it has data connections to things like to clever things like where's the cheapest petrol in this area where's the closest ATM where can I buy real ale whatever it is in that environment and I can pull it out of out of these um, out of this here so wickitude is a really interesting thing for businesses to realize that even if they don't want to get involved in augmented reality they already are if they're in a database The next product I want to show you is Orasma. Has anyone had a play with Orasma? You've got to type that carefully into Google. But Orasma is, is a really interesting um, new product that's come out that allows you to create any digital, sorry, any printed materials. And, and you can do this yourself. You can create any printed material, preferably that doesn't have so much light on it in this. Any printed material you can connect to anything on the internet. So it could be a video of your products and services. It could be an interview of a chief exec talking about the values of the business. It could be customer testimonials. It could be anything. So this sort of thing is really useful for small businesses. There's another app called Blipar. Has anyone had play with Blipar? Oh, it's doing it. There you go. If I move it, you can see that I am still in the augmented reality environment. Oh, it's gone off. <laughs> I'm still in the augmented reality environment, and I can move my phone around to pick it up in that environment. This is Orasma, as I say, any business can use this product. There's also another one out there called Blipar, and um, Blipar is being used by the big corporates at the moment, the big retail side of things. And if any of you have um, tomato ketchup at home, or um, any of the sort of big product, Marmite, any of the big products like that, and if you download Blipar and show Blipar tomato ketchup, up pops a whole video, um, an interactive environment with lots and lots of different uh, recipes on it, and you can click and you can watch people making the recipes, and you can download the ingredients, and you're in a completely different world. If you use it on a Diet Coke bottle, what appears at the front of the Diet Coke bottle is um, a music environment where you can play music that Diet Coke own, and you can share that with your friends, and you can interact in that environment. Now, what's really clever around that is that it's a deep customer engagement experience. They're not advertising this everywhere. They're not saying, come and look at this, come and look at it. What they want you to do is to tell your friends and your friends tell their friends and move it in that environment. So augmented reality is a really interesting one. It's not just, though, for sales. One of the things around augmented reality, if I can move back to my normal screen, Rob, thanks. <clears throat> One of the things around augmented reality is you can use it for anything. This is um, Mitsubishi, and they've used it for air conditioning units. So you take the front of the air conditioning unit, your repairman can take, can show the unit their phone, and up pops all the parts, and you click on the parts, and you can see the user manual for those parts. And you can click to buy those parts. So from a manufacturing point of view, this is about, you can see here, this is about making sure that people who are replacing parts in their systems are replacing them with the right parts and doing it correctly as well. And any of you that are involved in manufacture know how difficult that environment is for most businesses. So they're using it like this. They, BMW are starting to use it for their cars. So the mechanics open the lids of their cars. They look at the augmented reality environment. And also what plugs into that is all the information that's held on your key. So how fast you drove, the last time you had brakes fitted, when you had last um, service, all of that information sits within the, the, the place as well. So they do know that I drive like a crazy person around the country lanes. 
Whatever it is, it, it will tell them in that environment. So augmented reality, I think, is something that we can get small businesses excited about. It will help them to start to think about it now so that they're ready for it when it really happens in the future. We can also use our tablets uh, sorry, our mobile phones and tablets in different environments as well. This is a quick video. This is an Apple video. Bechtel are using, um, are using apps um, for concrete curing. <laughs> so they are placing into the concrete small devices, and then from any, any of the engineer's tablets or mobile phone environments, they can see the temperature of the concrete, the water content, how, how near to curing is it, in every layer of the concrete that they're pouring. So, you know, it's being used not just in the retail world, in lots of other environments as well. Okay, so the second trend I'm gonna talk about is cloud. How many of you are using the cloud currently? How many of you got a Gmail account, Yahoo account, any BT account, anything like that? How many of you are using cloud in your business, in, in the council or in, any of those environments? Not quite so many. So cloud is just coming in, really, into the business environment. We've been using it at home for a long, long time. Does everyone understand what I mean by the cloud? The cloud is basically just us using technology that isn't on our desktops, our laptops, or on a server that we own. So it's about utilizing something somewhere else. It's a great description, isn't it? <laughs> I'll come back to that in a second. I'll describe more in a second. But cloud for business is a really, really booming place at the moment. It's growing at the moment 30%, and the expectation is 30% year on year for the next three years. Again, from Gartner that came out towards the end of last year, their expectation is by next year, 60% of server workloads will be virtualized. So 60% of this stuff in businesses will be on the cloud at that point. This is why I didn't explain it too well to you, because what I wanted to say to you was that what we can do with cloud is we can replace certain parts of the functions of our businesses or our organizations by using the cloud, or we can replace all of it. We can do it in parts or all of it. We can replace software. We can replace file storage. We can replace email, exchange, those sorts of things. And we can replace platforms. We can even replace infrastructure with the cloud environment. But what it's not about are these. It's not about your hardware. And it's not about what we call the old hosted solutions but I won't go into too much about that today. The significant benefit to business is the fact that we don't have to invest in capital when we want new IT. We don't have to buy new servers. Instead of that, we can pay a pay-as-you-go fee. We can pay a monthly fee. So we're replacing that capex with an opex environment. It's also incredibly flexible, and I'll show you some, some things around that. And you don't have to buy these so often because we're not dependent on the quality of what we've got in our hands so much. It's more about the power, it's more about the connectivity than it is the power of our computers. <clears throat> we're talking about flexing. These are four typical business IT patterns. This, to me, is a typical holiday business. They're either on or they're off. They're either in that full-on environment or it's um, November and they've, and they've switched off. There's some businesses that are just in the growth phase and they're growing really fast. But there's other businesses, this is a bit like our business, that actually has peaks and peaks unexpectedly in that environment. And one of the things with all of these is that there's a waste of the amount of IT that you need to invest in these things, particularly with the fast growth one. If we look, we need to invest in IT at this point, and then we have to have a massive jump of capital cost 
to keep us going to our next level. So 20, 30,000 pounds worth of capital can be tied up in a business because they expect to grow. And that's one of the things that holds back a lot of businesses is the amount of capital they have in it. But one of the things about cloud is cloud is switch on, switch off. Cloud is I can add a user every day if I want to. I can add five users. I can switch five users off. And I just I only pay a monthly fee. So flexibility is really, really important with the cloud. Has anyone seen the hype cycle? If you like things like this, do have a look at it for real, because it's a great one. This is, again, this is Gartner's. If you Google Gartner's hype cycle, you'll start, you, you can see this is 2012, and I'm going to show you 2013s. These come out at the beginning of the year, every year. And what they're saying is, with technology, where is the technology really at? Is it at the point of which it's all just a lot of hot air at the moment? It's all just a bit of hype? Or is it at the point of which, when we get from here onwards, is it at the point that it's really usable, that businesses have really implemented it, and it's embedded in our kind of cultures? And you can see that at the beginning of 2012, cloud was here. If you look back to 2010, it was, or 2011, it was up here. It was right at the top of it. Everyone was talking cloud, cloud, cloud. It's now coming down into this area here. Beginning of 2013, it's now at the point at which we can use it. And that's why I think technologists are getting really excited about it now, because it really is a sensible solution for businesses now. Particularly because Office, Windows XP, will be no more from April next year. So many businesses have suddenly got a driver that they're going to have to replace the software on their machines from April to something new. The, the reason I've also brought this in is do have a look, particularly at this side of things, and do, do you know, keep an eye on this, because it's really good for you to sort of just get that reality check, really, as to where a lot of technology is at the moment. <clears throat> so cloud, the words that you'll hear in cloud, there's a lot of acronyms in cloud. There's SAS, PaaS, and EAS, and loads of others. And all they mean is SAS software as a service, PaaS platform as a service, and EAS as infrastructure as a service. And they are different ways in which you can use cloud. So software is literally just replacing something that you use from your server at the moment or from your computer at the moment in the cloud. Platform is actually being able to put the whole of your system into a cloud environment and to be able to develop and deploy into that environment. Infrastructure is having everything in there, networks, LANs, WANs, everything in that environment. And the other thing you'll hear quite a lot about is public and private clouds. Private clouds, excuse me, private clouds are where the whole infrastructure sits behind a gated community. So in a local authority or in a corporate environment, those will be private clouds. What I'm going to talk today about, or what we're talking today about, is mostly the public cloud, which is using the internet to access a service. Does that make sense? Just using your normal browser and internet in that environment. And the thing about public cloud is it is no capital up front, flex on, flex off. Obviously, if you're going to go down the private cloud route, you have got to invest quite a bit into it. Underneath the software as a service, underneath that, that first one that we, we saw, there are also loads and loads of things that you can do. It's one of the biggest areas in cloud at the moment is software as a service. And these have got all funny acronyms as well. And you can make up your own, because it seems that everyone is doing that at the moment with it. So there's cloud as storage, cloud as backup, cloud as product productivity, cloud as communication, cloud as CRM, all of those sorts of things in there. And I can send you some links for those as well. 
Have any of you used any of these products? Dropbox. Doodle. Talk a bit about Doodle in a second. Okay. Picnic is no more. It's now Pick Monkey. Anyone use Pick Monkey? It's a fantastic photograph and editing piece of software. So you can upload an image, you can crop it, resize it, you can add words to it, you can put things on it and download it back again for free. It's a fabulous product, Pick Monkey. <clears throat> But let's talk a bit about Dropbox first. So Dropbox sits in the cloud as storage environment. This is you using, in essence, a piece of software as your file server. That's what it is. Dropbox was the first. It has the market share. You can get 16 gig for free in that environment. 16 gig. Remember when we had those computers first in, our, in the corner of our office? Well, I think we were talking about 4 meg, weren't we, or the Pentium processor in that environment, 16 gig for free. But one of the great things about Dropbox is it's got a really, really good third-party community of people that are developing other apps that will save into Dropbox. I don't know if you've seen many of them recently. There's, um, on, on, in the iPad environment, there's a product called Elements that allows you to take notes save straight into Dropbox. There's one called Cloud On that does the same. There's one called Skitch does the same. So there's lots of products that are now pulling into the Dropbox environment. Anyone got a Google Drive account? Anyone got a Gmail? OK, if you've got Gmail, you've already got a Google Drive. You can get 15 gig of storage. They're already for free. <laughs> It's there for you, and it has some fantastic plugins. One of the plugins you can use on it is in your browser, you can put a little sticker in the top corner that you can save anything you're looking at straight into your Google Drive. Any PDFs, any documents, anything into your PDF environment, into your um, Google Drive environment. SkyDrive. Anyone use SkyDrive? Sort of. It's Microsoft's version of it came out, I think, last year. It's a bit of a weak and woolly response to, to it, but it's Microsoft's version of it. And when we talk in a bit about Office 365, SkyDrive is the one that you're using in that environment. So this really is a, a, a solid Microsoft environment. Businesses can also use cloud as a quick way to back up all their systems. There are some fantastic products out there. Carbonite is one of them that will allow them just to simply say, all of these computers and this server, I want to be, to be backed up every night, every week, whatever. And nobody in the office has to change a tape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Such a big deal in the office. Who's going to change a tape? So it's a really, really great way of doing that. They get pretty much look, for $200 a year they can save pretty much all their stuff up there. Now, one of the benefits of that is disaster recovery. If they have a fire in their building or whatever, they can spring back up because they have a complete server solution straight back again. So Carbonite is really, really powerful for businesses. We can also use cloud for productivity. I mentioned Doodle. Has everyone heard of Doodle? It's an absolutely fantastic product. I use it in business world and sadly enough also in my, with my friends to organise a lunch or something. We organise all our meetings through Doodle. It's fabulous. Does anyone use Podio? Fantastic project management software that allows you to really simply create any app you want to. So you, if you say, I want to create a database of contacts, it will say, OK, here's your template. What else do you want? If you say, I want to create a project management tool with milestones, it says, OK, here you go. And in that environment, you can then, it's completely technology agnostic. You can pick it up from your phone, your tablet, your desktop, any environment. And you can push tasks out. So as you're creating a project management 
you know, piece, you can say, right, you need to do the leaflets, you need to sort this out or whatever, and you push tasks out to people. And you can even set up email alerts to remind people to do it. So Podio is a really powerful one, and Trello as well. Basecamp is similar. We use Basecamp in our business, and we, we develop websites. And so what we do is invite our clients into our Basecamp environment and invite them to drop in their images, their video, all the content they want into the Basecamp environment so we can then work from it in that place. So there's some really fab cloud products for productivity. There's also CRM systems. There's some of the big boys, Dynamics, Salesforce, all of those sorts of ones out there. But there's also some really lightweight ones. Has anyone played with Capsule? It's a CRM system. It's a fabulous product because the way it's been built, it's been built to be completely open and to interface with loads of other cloud products. So it's CRM and it connects to finance. How exciting. Put someone's information in once, gets copied over to finance ready for an invoice. It also sits with MailChimp. Someone's email address in here gets straight into an e-newsletter system. It can sit with the website. It can sit with about 100 different apps and different products in that environment. So some, some technology developers are starting to think about that wider piece about how we can connect with other businesses, uh, sorry, with other pieces of software. And the great thing about new CRM systems is it's not just about people typing stuff in, which is what CRM systems used to mean to me, certainly. Oh God, I've got to write that. I've got to write up what I did with the client. I've got to write up my meeting. Now, you still do need to do a bit of that, but now any email you send out to that client will also be copied into the CRM system. So a history of all of your staff's conversations with that client are held in the CRM system. The same with the telephone calls. The same with social media. So if you've had a Twitter chat with one of your clients, the history of that will be kept within the CRM system. So the CRM systems now can be much more representative of a whole picture of the business rather than just a few little areas of it. We're also using cloud for communication, and I think the lady that's on next is going to be talking a bit more about this, about Skype. But I just wanted to refer to it a little bit here to say, has anyone had a play with Google Hangouts? It's a great, great place. It's got you can invite 10 people into a Google Hangout, which is a video conferencing environment. It's really easy to switch on and off to invite people in and out. And you can share screens. So you can do collaboration and sh sh that's hard to say. <laughs> Screen sharing um, really, really quickly and easily. <laughs> and it's interesting, if, if you are interested in this stuff, because um, Microsoft, you know, have just bought, well, bought Skype. So the Microsoft answer to this before has been Microsoft Link. And Microsoft have just bought Skype, and they've just bought Nokia. And the reason for this is that the next big battleground for these software giants is what we call unified comms, unified communications. The concept being that I can ring you, and whether you are on a mobile phone, a desktop, on your work phone, or on a tablet, or anywhere, you will answer the phone. How fantastic would that be? That you don't get a, sorry, she's not in the office at the moment, can you ring her on her mobile, here's her number. That instead of that, you get straight through to a person or to an answer message or whatever. So that's the kind of concept of unified comms in that environment. And that's currently the big battleground between Microsoft and, and Google in that environment. And the big thing around this is we have to have good, super fast broadband to enable this to happen because upload speeds are really, really important with this. Current broadband speeds, because upload can be as low as well, half a meg, it cannot cope with video conferencing very well. So as I said, the two big guys in this area are Google 
and Microsoft. Google's answer is Google Apps. Don't get confused with the word apps. It's, a, it's their cloud solution. And Microsoft 365. Two very different approaches. Google Apps is all about being open. It's all about saying, hey, all you great software guys out there, come and connect with our platform. So with Google Apps, you can connect with Smartsheet, which can run all your project management stuff, Podio. It can connect with Expensify. Has anyone had a play with Expensify as an app? No. It builds your expenses sheet line by line as you go through the month. So as you get in the car, you press start, it tracks your mileage. You press stop and it puts a line into your expense sheet. As you get a coffee, you photograph the receipt and it puts a line into your expense sheet that you bought the coffee and where it was in the time. It's a fabulous product. But anyway, you can connect all of that stuff into Google Apps in that environment. Office 365, in the other, on the other hand, is completely the opposite. So where Google is very open and out, 365 is very closed and in. But for good reasons, it's an enterprise solution. It's a solution for big businesses that need to manage their risk. So 365 is the solution at that. It starts at around about £6.50 a month. But for a small business, really, it's about £9 per month per person in the business. So you can see that normally, if you had 10 to 15 people in your business, it's about a £20,000 investment in all of this stuff. You can do it instead for £9.50 a month. What each business needs to do, though, is work out the figures that over a five-year lifespan, which one's more cost-effective? So they do need to do that. But 365 has office in it. But it's always the most up-to-date version. You'll never have to buy another version of Microsoft Office. Always up-to-date. It has SharePoint, so it has your internet environment. It has the full version of Exchange, so your IT administrators will never have to patch Exchange ever again. And Link, this environment, this video comms type environment in there. And all of that comes in together for £9 a month, which is you know, incredible value for money. It goes up from there as well. And it's highly secure. I've put, oh, you can't see it, but down here, I've put some links on here for you to have a look at. But in Microsoft and Google and all of the big guys in this stuff are continuously having penetration tests. Um, they're having all of their security tested, calibrated, checked all the time. This is more secure than the server that you've got in the corner of your office. So the fears around security aren't such an issue anymore. However, if you do have government contracts, one of the data protection issues you must be aware of is you must know where your data is being stored and what country it's being stored in. And most contracts will say it needs to be in the EU. So, and you can check that. You can find out where it is in that environment. EU or a safe harbor, it's called, which is um, some of the US environments. Okay. <clears throat> So people say, what do I do? Do I go apps, Google Apps, or do I go 365? It completely depends on what you like. If you are an office person through and through, you love office, you've always used to it, then stick with office. If you are, though, as a business, innovative, open, interested in this stuff, then, three, six, and then apps is a good way to go. So it's more of a cultural thing than it is really anything else in that environment. How am I doing for time? OK. OK, this is a really short one, this middle bit. <clears throat> the third trend we've got is around social media. We know social media isn't a new thing anymore. It's completely mainstream. I've just got some figures here for the UK, but I'm sure that they're very similar in, in the rest of Europe as well. That, does anyone know the average age of a Facebook user in the UK. It's more than 12. <laughs> it's 38. So it's more mainstream than we think. Twitter, average age? Thirty-eight. 
39. It's really right in the middle there. 50% um, of people of pensionable age have a Facebook profile in the UK. 48% of them were set up by their grandchildren. <laughs> That's not a real stat, the 48%. The 50% is, 48% isn't. And we saw earlier that 90% of Twitter users are mobile active. So as I say, this is just mainstream now. It's just something we should all be doing. <clears throat> but what is new? Well, video is certainly becoming the big thing. I'm sure you all use YouTube. You've all been on YouTube. YouTube is now the second biggest search engine in the world. Google is the first. Guess who owns YouTube? Google. So Google are first and second in the search engine environment. So it's, video is becoming more important in search engine results. But also, it's really important for customer engagement. It's so much better to watch a video than to read a whole page of text. We know that. Because also, what comes across in a video is emotion and connection. And you don't get that in a piece of text. So video is something that's really significant. But also, you can use video to learn yourself. I don't know if you've been on it, but iTunes U and YouTube Edu are two video environments that have all the lectures from all the major universities on there. So if you want to learn about something amazing, just have a look on there, and you can learn some really good stuff. But also what's happening in social media is we're all getting a bit sick of the noise in social media. There's so much stuff coming at us all the time in that environment. And so what's starting to happen is what we call curation. We are starting to say, I only want to hear about the bits I'm interested in. And there's some products now that help you to do that. Has anyone played with Pinterest? Fantastic product. Has anyone had a go with Flipboard, which is this one here? No. Have a look at Flipboard if you've got a tablet environment. It allows you to plug in your social media feeds, but also other stuff you're interested in. And then what you'll find is that it starts to learn your behaviours and will start to suggest bloggers, um, LinkedIn people, all of those sorts of things that will create content, that will give you content that's relevant to you. So curation is something that's important. And for businesses, what's important about that is about tagging. You must start to tag their content with what it's about, because then they'll be found by customers that are interested in that stuff. So it's bypassing the search engines. It's coming up through the social media environment. <clears throat> And also, authorship is becoming important. Does anyone know their clout score? Go on, tell me. 43. 43. That's good. Anyone else? No. Your clout score is, well, is clout, and peer index is another one of them. And what it's trying to say is how influential are you in the social world? How influential are you online? And it's not just saying, how often do you tweet? It's saying, who listens to you? Who retweets you? And how influential are they? And it's saying, in LinkedIn, what is your business title? Who are you connected to? And how important are they? So it's starting to get much more intelligent. And you can do this for yourself as an individual, but also for your business or organization. And what's interesting around this is you can start to think a bit more strategically about social media, because we're seeing it being used in a boardroom. We're seeing that the board can make a decision that X company, this company, has a clout score of 50, and their competitor has a clout score of 65. So what's their strategic objective for the next year? is to move their score to 65 or to beat the competition. So it's, it's a really useful tool in that environment. The other reason it's useful 
is that Google and Bing are starting to say, the content you have on your website, who wrote it? And how influential are they? And if there's two articles about super fast broadband, and one has been written by someone influential, and one hasn't been written by someone influential, guess which one's going to appear first? The one that has authorship. So authorship is the buzzword for the next, uh, for the next, certainly the next 12 months. And do check your clout score. <clears throat> That's my third area. The fourth area is around information. We are generating so much more data than we've ever generated before. In the last two years, we've created 90% of the data that exists on this planet in the last two years. It's completely exponential, the growth of data at the moment. It's astonishing. And it's growing and growing and growing at the moment in that environment. And even in our businesses and organizations, we have shed loads of data. But what we're not doing with that data is creating any type of intelligence out of it. We're just storing it, just keeping it there. Why is data important? Because now, Technology is at the point of which we can use, it's so powerful that we can create algorithms that will help use that data to predict the future of our customers. Not the future completely, but the future of our customers and our businesses. The big corporates are using it at the moment. Tesco's are using it for 20% of Tesco customers. They can predict the exact time, date, and spend of those customers for 20% of them. And if you notice now, when you go into supermarkets, they'll be starting to offer you free Wi-Fi when you go in. That's not for your benefit. <laughs> That's because they're going to start tracking you going around the store so that they can get their prediction models from just 20% of their customers to 80% of their customers. Mobile phone companies can predict the date that you're going to ring up and say, I don't want to be with you anymore. I want to change to another provider. And Hewlett Packard have created what they call a flight risk model. When you're employed by Hewlett Packard, they predict the date you're going to leave the business. And they make the decision then as to when they're going to, whether they want to keep you or not, and whether, therefore, what motivation you need to stay in that business. So it's being used in all sorts of places. There's a fantastic book out there called Predictive Analytics by Eric Siegel. If you want to have a, a read of more of this stuff, it's really, really interesting. And currently, as small businesses, we can't quite get that algorithms yet. They're not quite here for us, but they will be very, very soon. So one of the things we need to be thinking about is what data we have in our businesses and organizations. We have web analytics. There's a mine of information in, in our Google Analytics environment. Who's been to our site, what they typed into Google to get to our site, what they did on our site, what device did they use when they got on our site, how long did they stay, what pages, when did they abandon the site, all of that information is, is already in there. We've also got social analytics. Products like Social Sprout, products like Clout, are picking up all of that information about how we interact and how customers interact with us in that environment. Sprout Social is a really interesting one. It will tell us the demographics of our um, customers, of our followers in social media. It will tell us the best time of day to post the best day of the week to post, the most engaging conversations we've had. All of that stuff is out there for us to look at. Our CRM systems. Currently, as I say, a lot of people, a lot of businesses use a CRM system just as a place to put stuff. 
But when we put the layer of predictive analytics over the top of it, we can suddenly see that a customer that has a black Labrador and a car that's silver <laughs> will buy this product in the next six months, whatever the, the algorithm is that it will come out with. Also, our emails. There's products that are starting to come out now that will, what they call, provide sentiment analysis of our emails. So it will say, and will look at the actual content of our emails, and again, look at the predictive nature of them. And any support queries that we take, any support desk activity, all of that in a business equates to this big data environment that we're in now. But also, there's opportunities for us. The government and local governments are opening their data. Bus timetables, bin routes, disabled access, all of those sorts of data sets are now available for any business to use. And so there's opportunities there within the big data environment for businesses to create new products that their customers might like to use as well. I don't know if anyone saw this, but certainly um, the LA police are, are taking big data very seriously. They've created a, a pilot project with one of the districts in LA, and they can predict now the time, date, and location of every crime in that district, which is really astonishing. And they've changed their whole patrolling methods to go towards predictive analytics. So the minority report really is here already in that environment. We know this stuff is important, but recent research is showing that businesses are not touching this. In fact, I think the phrase is analytically challenged. Most of our businesses are just ignoring it. And I think this is something that we can help businesses start to think about, even at the moment, even if they just keep data so they're ready to start thinking about predictive analytics, then that's a really useful thing for them to do. Because where this is going to is what we call the Internet of Things. Has anyone heard that phrase? It's been banded around quite a lot recently, the Internet of Things. Which means when the Internet started, what it did is it categorised or it, it listed, it got all the text. That was the first place for it, wasn't it? The text of, of, of the planet. So we got the text. Then it started to index images. So we got images in there. What it's just done is indexed people. Social media is indexing people. And the thing it's now doing is indexing things. And things currently mean mobile phones, it means computers, it means our intelligent key, keys in our cars, it means those things. But where that's moving to is to everything. So the next step is what we call wearable devices. The Google Glasses environment, the smart watches, all of that stuff. That will be the next bit that we index. But then after that, it will be connected things, anything, tables, chairs, lamps. And then from there is the point at which anything, virtually anything, will be connected. So let's take the scenario when we've bought our shopping, we've brought it home, we've dumped it on the kitchen table, we've put the carrots in the fridge, we've put everything away. We get a note on our phone a week and a half later saying, your carrots are about to go off. You, and uh, you get the note as you're driving past Tesco to say, you've run out of coriander, pop into Tesco's to get your coriander so you can make carrot and coriander soup tonight. Here's the recipe. Oh, and by the way, the kids don't get home till 5.30 or 6.30 tonight, so you've got a bit of time to do it. <laughs> that's, the, that's the connectivity that we're going to get very soon. 
And don't just put your tinfoil hat on now and go and sit in a corner. <laughs> but, but you can see that, I mean, I've given you, you know, a, a silly example there, but you can see the example that we're driving to a venue. When I was driving here today, the, the Internet of Things would have told me that there was uh, traffic jams at these locations. It would have told me that the service go to this particular um, services because it's got cheaper petrol and the coffee is the coffee that I like. And, you know, it will give you that kind of information that's personal to you. And this is why super fast broadband and connectivity, 4G connectivity and GPS is so important. And particularly for manufacturers, this is really important because in the manufacturing world, these cheap embedded chips could be put on any product that they sell. They can then get back data, anonymous data, about usage, about overusage, about when they need to have new parts, all of those sorts of information. And that can be just pulled back really quickly and easily into this environment. I haven't got time to show you that one, so I'll just <laughs> drop it that point. So, I hope that's given you a bit of a whistle-stop tour into where I think the technologies are currently for businesses and also a little bit about where the future's going for businesses at the moment.